honorees embodies the breadth and depth of the field of psychology, and each has been a pioneer in her own way. Um, Dr. Chang is the first ethnic minority woman to serve on APA's board of directors, Dr. Gupta as founder of the 3D program for women and girls, and Dr. Kamakami on, in her role as the first woman of Asian descent to serve as an editor of an APA journal. So I'm just wondering, we know where you are now, what sort of girl were you like? What was your childhood like? Please. Um, I was um, the fourth of four children in a very conservative, stereotypical Chinese immigrant family. So I was very quiet and very submissive. I changed. <laughs> um, pretty similar. Uh, I was a middle child of three in an Indian family and very quiet, underconfident, and not shy so much as not very talkative. Didn't say much. Wanted very much to be a good girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, very similar. <laughs> I, was, um, I grew up in a small logging town in British Columbia, Canada, and uh, the middle child of six, uh, six children. And um, yeah, shy, um, used to follow my brother around and try and keep up with them, but yeah, very similar. So what changed for you all? <laughs> um, it didn't change for me that I realized it was changing. Um, what, what changed was I kept going, and as I graduated from my graduate studies, I became very involved in the American Psychological Association by default, but I actually became involved. And as I became involved, there were people that were interested in women in psychology. I'd never heard of that before. And so that changed, and as that changed, I began to grow in terms of my public service. But you. For me, I think what changed was um, a fairly traumatic event that occurred um, when I was in eighth grade, um, where I had a teacher who was emotionally abusive, mm -hmm. extremely so. And I couldn't talk about it. I was um, quiet about it at home. Uh, but it all eventually came out, and I sort of was provided the supports by the school principal um, to sort of slowly build up again my self-esteem and my confidence. And, um, and once that was established through a good academic record, mm -hmm. which I had failed most of my school years um, in many, many subjects. So by the time I graduated from high school, because in those days those examinations were graded by teachers outside of our school, all the way in England, actually. Wow. The Cambridge exam is what we gave. And I did really well on that after years of not doing well. Yeah. And it sort of proved to me this self-fulfilling prophecy that exists in faculty rooms. You know, when a child is branded as being not so good, everybody proves it to be true. Um, and that made me interested in what happened to me, which led me to psychology and made me work very hard to understand what psychology taught, especially the different schools of psychology. Mm -hmm. and became somebody different very consciously. I dressed differently after that. I decided I would be somebody else, not that person I was then. So it was a very conscious choice. And because I academically did well then and got recognition for it, um, I gained confidence over the years. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I've changed that much from the shy, uh, quiet girl I was then, but um, one of the things that really drove me to understand, try and understand psychology and diversity and discrimination was that my father was placed in a uh, Japanese internment camp during mm -hmm. the Second World War. So I knew the importance of um, social justice, and I wanted to better understand um, processes related to social categorization and their implications. So you know, when, why do people perceive others as belonging to cer certain categories? And um, how you can change associations related to those types of categories. So mm -hmm. it was just something that always was of interest and seemed important to me. So that's, yeah. So I could still be shy and quiet and work in the lab trying to figure <laughs> it out. So I never really had to extend myself beyond, beyond those, mm -hmm. kind of that world. <laughs> so um, Dr. Chang, you didn't actually say what brought you to psychology. Oh, my story's interesting. You know that in Chinese families, 
the stereotype is that everybody needs to become a psycho not become a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I left high school thinking I was going to become an organic chemist. But I went to UCLA and of course I didn't make good enough grades to be a chemistry major. And then I got sort of discouraged and dropped out of school. And um, when I went back, I decided I should look for uh, something that I made good grades in so I could graduate from college. <laughs> and so this is survival skills. I always tell my <laughs> students, you know, you have to use a little bit of common sense to survive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did well in English and I did well in psychology. Little did I know at that time that if you didn't get a PhD in psychology, you weren't going to be able to make it in the field. Nowadays, that's slightly different, but in the 60s and 70s, that was not the case. And so I ended up getting a PhD in psychology just out of nece necessity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you've talked about inspirational figures or folks who've had a major impact in your lives. Are, um, oh, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, the major impact was there was, when I went back to um, UCLA, they had a dean of women at that time. And she said, surely with the kinds of recommendations and the um, grades and SAT scores you had, something awful must have happened to you uh, that you just disappeared from school. I dropped out and I was one of those Asian statistics that tried to commit suicide. Mm. And um, I said, well, my f I didn't, what I didn't say was I came from the stereotypical traditional family where uh, women were not valued because I never said those sorts of things while my parents were still living. So since my parents are not, no longer living and since my family all knows I feel this way, um, I'm very public about it now because um, in many of the Asian families and still today, um, women are not valued. And I feel like if I can show people that women are valued in whatever way, that it helps. Um, so the Dean of Women said, and the Dean of Women wrote a letter to my parents, asked my parents if they would support me coming back to school. And my parents wrote, this is what they wrote because I have a copy of it. This is not a daughter of ours. Uh, we will not be helping her. We have two sons in college. We are taking care of them. And so anyway, the Dean of Women uh, immediately put me on a work study project and uh, gave me a national defense and education loan. Mm -hmm. And so I went to UCLA and I worked my way through on uh, work study. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful. That was a major role model, but I didn't know she was a role model at that time. Mm -hmm. The next role model was a psychologist that suggested <coughs> that every time I said I was overwhelmed that I threatened my classmates. And I was overwhelmed all the time because I was scared to death. But um, so, he suggested that I get a little experience, and he set me up with a whole lot of experiential uh, things that I could do, research projects, what we call student consulting. And I was very happy to do that and very excited, and then that was great mentoring for me, so I'm very thankful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the rest of the mentoring for what I do today and what I did for APA happened at APA with the Council of Representatives with uh, Division 35. Mm -hmm. um, I got brave enough to start the Ethnic Minority Caucus when there were no caucuses for ethnic minorities. And actually, the staff, and some of you will remember this, the staff from public interest had to come and sit at our table so that we could have some conversations of what we needed to do for the mm -hmm. underserved populations. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, APA's been very important to me, and big role models in APA. Thank you. And for you, role models? It's, it's sort of interesting to see um, the parallels, but, but differences too. So I grew up in a family where the women were very strong, very confident. I came uh, from an Indian family where my mother was the third generation working woman outside the home. So um, it was <coughs> my role models at home were very strong, career-oriented women, mm. confident. Um, and so mine was more to rise up to that bar rather than any pressure to do science or engineering, which also typically exists in Indian families. Um, but what happened to me then is when I started going to college, I realized that not all girls live in families like mine, and that the inequalities that they experienced 
Um, the fact that my classmates in the second year of college were discussing um, getting married and that boys were coming to see them for arranged marriages made me aware suddenly that I lived in a society that was very different mm. from the family in which I had grown up. Um, and so I think that that's what inspired me, that combined with the many women role models I had in the family, to sort of look into those gender inequalities and see um, what is the psychology of society mm. that shoves women aside and oppresses them in such a strong way. The inequality indicators in India are still um, very stark and um, cannot be justified given the economic growth in India. So there's something clearly happening um, within society that holds women back. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to try and understand that, I became a clinical psychologist because I thought I'm gonna fix one man at a time <laughs> <laughs> and fix this problem once and for all. And that's what led to the setting up of the counseling center and the suicide prevention center. Mm -hmm. But um, in four years, I realized pretty quickly that this requires bigger policy changes, it requires laws to change, and that's what led me in the direction of policy work for women living in poverty, for women in development. So I would say my biggest inspiration, it's very cliched, is my mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> who managed to um, do it all and raise incredible daughters, um, but also the women I worked for. You know, the women in, who live in poverty, who live against, enor despite enormous mm. odds, and suffer such incredible oppression and discrimination, how they continue to keep their families together, work hard, earn the resources, even if they don't have jobs, they figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and still, if you ask them, what's the, they get beaten at home, they experience such uh, gross violations of their rights. Mm -hmm. And yet if you ask them, what's your single highest priority of how I can help you, it's always food for my children. And that's startling to me mm -hmm. and in incredibly impressive um, how they make things happen despite the limited resources they have. Right. Thank you. Um, when I previewed this question, I automatically thought about um, researchers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so I'm going to limit myself to that rather than the larger context. Um, but. I think in social psychology, we're really lucky because there are so many strong women leaders and strong women researchers. Um, and you know, my research is related to understanding social categorization and discrimination, prejudice, stereotyping. Um, and there have been some amazing women who have studied that. And I value them for their contribution to the field, uh, for their mentorship, for the um, quality of their ideas. Um, Nali, Nali, Nalini Ambati, um, mm -hmm. Alice Eagley, uh, Susan Fisk are just some of the people that have really kind of drove, driven the way that I thought about, about biases, but also um, men like Sam Gertner and Jack DeVidio and Galen Bodenhausen. Um, just that I, I feel like as a, a minority woman that um, I can, well, this is my, my perspective, it's probably wrong, but. <laughs> that I can, I have a gut feeling about when it feels like something's real or not. When categorization, what they propose is categorization pro processes and effects, whether that is the way it's worked out in my life, the way it's run its course in my life. And so I felt like I had this kind of insider knowledge about what real biases was that is probably not the case, but, <laughs> but that helped me drive my career. But um, really people who have, have been really thoughtful and smart and um, had really, yeah, I, f I feel like truthful ideas or real ideas about how, how biases all play out, um, mm -hmm. those have been the real mentors to me. And you each have sort of different levels of planfulness over the course of your careers, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Like, um, what led you to believe that you could do the work that you're doing now? It's hmm. an interesting question. <laughs> I didn't think I could do it. Yeah, I, I remember. didn't either. <laughs> and, I yeah. didn't either. I felt like a failure so many times. And still? And still, you know, there's a little survivor instinct. And I think that many of us have that, that, you know, we look around us and we don't want to be where some people are. And I've always wondered why some people in my circumstance made it 
and why other people didn't. And mm -hmm. I've always wanted to study that. Mm -hmm. But I never have because I wanted to be an academician. And I ended up being in clinical work, which I learned to love. And clinical work turns out to be very similar. You just guide individuals or groups instead of guiding classes of students. Uh, so it turned out to be very similar. But I, I still wonder uh, who survives and what the mechanism is for their survival, especially in the underrepresented groups. You know, you mentioned that I'm still the only Asian American that has made it to the board of directors for the APA. And I think about that because this was almost 30 years ago. And um, the ethnic minorities that I mentored on council were not Asian. There was one Asian male, and then the others were not Asian. Uh, the other females were not Asian. So that makes me question how the leadership encourages or discourages Asian women from going higher in their um, outside public service. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of the dual role that you hear stereotypically of women in the home versus women outside the home. And so I, I still think that this needs to be examined more clearly. I ended up on APA Council, can I tell the story? Sure. By default, every year, I, the nice people of Kansas, uh, which as most of you know is population majority uh, Caucasian, uh, would put me on the ballot for representative to Council of Representatives, and every year a white male would win. They would go to the first council meeting and come back and say it was too much work, they wouldn't want to do it. So could the alternate go? Well, Dr. Chang, you can go, right? <laughs> so I would take off of work and I would go and I would do all the right things. Well, this happened two or three times. And then people said, well, will you run? And I, and I said, yes, I'll run. And I wrote in my statement, if I do not win this election, I will not go as the alternate for the state of Kansas. Mm. So the Kansas psychologist had better elect somebody that's going to represent them. I didn't quite say it that strongly, but definitely that was the mm. message. And definitely I won that election by landslide. <laughs> <laughs> Following that term on the Council of Representatives, I was elected to the Board of Directors. And so, you know, really and truly, um, I don't know how these things develop, but they just happen, mm -hmm. and they should happen. And that's what I try to tell uh, people in the younger generations. Expect things to happen. Mm -hmm. Do what you need to do to go forward. And you, if you have questions, ask people. You'll find that there are people that don't talk and don't speak up that have gone through similar situations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I agree 100% because um, it's the same message I give young people, is that don't plan too much. You know, people these days plan, I'll do this, then I'll do that, then I'll do that, because life throws you opportunities you could never have imagined. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you shut yourself out from those, then you miss big chances. Because my, my career, I did plan when mm -hmm. I was in college. I'd do my PhD and be a lecturer, then be a professor, and be married to some young gentleman. And, have two children and mm -hmm. have a scooter and maybe someday own a house many years later. That was my plan, mm -hmm. right? But here I am with one child, three cars, you know, a house in the U.S., never in my wildest dreams. Never wanted to come to the U.S., never thought we'd ever live here. So life happens. I also thought a lot about gender inequality, did my PhD on it but never thought that would be my career. Mm -hmm. It was a job opportunity that came up that I grabbed. Yes. Um, my husband's job brought us to the US. It was a temporary appointment for two years. I said, okay, I'll take a sabbatical and come with him. And then he kept getting extended mm -hmm. and I got restless. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do something and I sort of explained to people I work on women and development issues and they said, well, there's one place called the International Center for Research on Women. You might want to go check that out. Mm. But of course, in those days, they hadn't heard of, of the place where I got my PhD from, Bangalore University. They didn't know where that was. Um, they didn't know whether I could write English well. Um, I hadn't yet published articles from my PhD. I was in the process of doing that. 
So there were all these hurdles. So I finally joined as, um, and I didn't have a permit to work. I just had a permit to stay in the country as a spouse. Mm -hmm. And so I joined um, without pay uh, as a research mm -hmm. assistant mm -hmm. and had to, you know, had to prove myself. Um, and then ICAW sponsored me for a work permit. My husband then, you know, was extended. One thing led to another, and believe it or not, the week that he was called back to his job in India was the week that ICAW offered to sponsor me for a green card. Mm -hmm. And it was a fabulous job. I'd just begun the Women in AIDS program, mm -hmm. and I so wanted to do that work. And my husband went back to India and said to his bosses, um, I can't do this to my wife a second time. I can't drag her away from a job. So I'd like to get a sabbatical. And they just laughed at him and said, you've got to be kidding. We want you back here. We sent you there to get experience so that you could come back here. So he resigned without telling me uh -huh. and came back here. And we were on one child, five years old, and a salary of somebody just beginning their career. So it was a struggle. But as he says, ever since then, he's had a job and I've had a career and he's thrilled with that. <laughs> So, you know, it, it ha just happens. You feel it is being in the right place at the right time. But when you look back, it's because you worked a particular way, you had a particular mm -hmm. attitude, you developed certain relationships. Those things do count. Mm -hmm. They count a lot. And then, of course, you reach a point where you have choices. And then right. you plan to choose one over the other. But there's a large part of your career that sometimes just choice. happens. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I ever really planned this out either. Um, always interested in social justice. Like when I was 12 years old, I was reading books like Black Like Me and anything I could get my hands on mm -hmm. in that kind of realm. Um, and psychology, social psychology, because it's, it's biased at the interpersonal level, mm -hmm. just seemed to like it really fit for me. Mm -hmm. um, it all made sense to me. And um, yeah. I, I don't know, I just, it just happened, right? And I just feel like I'm really lucky. Um, I, I can't think of a career that, would, that I would enjoy more. Um, I can research what I want, I can work with who I want, I can collaborate with who I want. Um, it's really exciting to work with you know, graduate students and other researchers. And you know, I, I would do this job for free. It's, it's just something that I really think is important and, and that I love doing. <laughs> And I just, I think I was just lucky, yeah. right? And, but specifically about being a journal editor, like what led you to that? Um, research excites me. Mm -hmm. It kind of drives, mm -hmm. uh, drives my ambitions. And I especially like methodology. Um, I look at social cognitive processes. And um, yeah, so a journal editor was, was well, the reason I took it because it was because of the diversity, because I really wanted, I think it's important that associate editors, um, that we have, you know, a, a reasonable number of women, <laughs> half mm -hmm. preferably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> women on as associate editors and on the editorial board and ethnic minorities and racial minorities. Um, so that's why I took on that role, but I like the role as well. I like reading about research and, you know, you get it, you get it hot off the press before mm -hmm. it's even published, so that's mm -hmm. really exciting as well. And I like working with people. I love working with the other associate editors and kind of steering the field, you know, what's mm -hmm. important in the field, what's mm -hmm. not important in the field. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. And for folks don't, who don't know what associate editors do, can you just share a little bit about what they do and why it's important that it be a diverse pool of people? Yeah, OK. Um, so I, as editor, um, I get in, people submit manuscripts to me, uh, graduate students, researchers. Um, and then I uh, review some of them myself, and then I distribute some of them to the associate editors, who are all have expertise in different areas of social psychology. And they ask reviewers, and based on the comments and their own perspectives on the research, they decide whether it should be published or not. Um, and so manuscripts that get published um, uh, have a big impact, especially at JPSP, on people's careers. So if you publish, um, you know, a lot of papers <laughs> in high quality journals, then you'll have a good career. And so that's why it's so important that people who evaluate um, our research show, reflect the diversity in our field in terms of gender and racial and ethnic minorities. So um, yeah, they, 
publishing is, is how we're evaluated as academics. So um, it's really important that, that uh, people who evaluate our, our, our field are, um, uh, how do I want to say this? <laughs> the people who evaluate our work um, uh, understand what it is to be a minority, understand what it is um, mm -hmm. uh, to, about the importance of research, but also, yeah, that reflect, reflect who we are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Rao Gupta, you talked a little bit about the negotiation with your husband or him making a decision without consulting you. Absolutely. So can you all talk about sort of the balance between your personal and professional lives and how that's played out over the course of your careers? Um, I was very clear um, that my daughter came first. Mm. It was a um, difficult thing to follow through on in a career when you were an immigrant in, um, in an American organization mm -hmm. that was um, filled with women, many of whom were in similar situations like me with a little one. Um, but it was never really talked about that, that necess in those days, mm -hmm. um, this sort of you know, challenge of trying to balance the two. But my instructions to anybody who worked with me was if that phone rings and it's my daughter, and she needs me, I don't care what's at this table, what we're discussing, I'm leaving. And it was interesting to see how over time, it just got accepted. Nobody mm. questioned it beyond a point. Um, initially, they were sort of surprised and thought it was an Indian kind of thing maybe, <laughs> something different. Um, but over time, it actually created a culture where others could speak mm. up mm. and say, my child is sick. I can't do this, I need to get home, or can I bring my kid in? And then I had the incredible privilege of being president of the organization a few years down the road, mm -hmm. and actually introduced a policy where if your child has a slight cold and is not terribly infectious, and you want to come to work, feel free to bring the child in, or work from home. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, a colleague of mine uh, came to me, a man, who said, it's not fair to the women and men who don't have children. You've created a policy that benefits some and not all. I said, what might keep you at home? He said, if my dog is sick. I said, bring your dog right in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a pet among us. And I have to tell you, with the, few, the children who came in, nobody overused the policy. Uh, they did it when they had to. But when we had pets and children in the office, the stress level <laughs> yeah. dropped. And everybody suddenly realized what life's priorities are. What I'm doing mm -hmm. is not a life or death matter. There's something else in this world that matters. And I was able to sort of instill that in the organization mm -hmm. for as long as I ran it. Now in UNICEF, which is a hard driving organization for children, the work culture is very different. It's very much because you take public money to do good for people around the world. People really, really work around the clock, mm. especially when they're dealing with humanitarian work yeah. and often sacrifice their families because even the rotation policy, mm -hmm. you have to be abroad, you leave your family behind. So I tried within UNICEF as, as a senior manager to try and influence some mm. of those policies. But this is a challenge for organizations all around the world is how do you allow, how should life be more important than work and work be just a subsection of life <laughs> is something that organizations haven't quite fully figured out. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, I've, I've, we've all managed the best way we could, right? We remember driving down th the Beltway or 395 at six in the evening, rushing to get your child from daycare. Mm -hmm. It's a terrifying feeling that you're not going to get there in time. You're going to be charged fifteen dollars a minute after that. <laughs> um, it's it is terrifying. So I'm I'm very empathetic to young mothers or young fathers who are trying to cope with all of that simultaneously. And then the elder care. Mm -hmm. I went through that as well. I had my parents who lived with me, my mother-in-law who lived with me. Um, my mother-in-law and my mother had dementia. One had Alzheimer's. One had the form of dementia. Um, and that's a stressful time too. Mm -hmm. It's extremely stressful to try and manage that. 
So just be kind to each other is what I say to people all the time. Be kind. There's a life outside of work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. World view. Dr. Kawakami. Um, I think being an academic is great um, because you get the flexibility. You can mm -hmm. set your own hours outside of the teaching, so that's really nice. So I, I, I have two, I have an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old son, and so I was able to go to all their important events. But um, being an academic, you're also expected to put in a lot of hours. And I just don't think I was ever really good <laughs> at, making, at reducing the stress and, and making that nice balance between work and, and life. Uh, yeah, it, it still is a problem for me. I think I would, I would really like that I could put more emphasis on my personal life and less on my work, but um, I'm not able to do that right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a pro that's a real problem for me, mm -hmm. and I yeah, uh, one that that I would love to be able to resolve in better ways. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Well, Chief. I buried myself in my work because the only thing I knew was to work and to go to school and do research. And so that's what I did most of my life. And then um, I got sick. And so when I, I got cancer, just about the time I was elected to the board of directors. So um, actually the board of directors became my family. I was going to resign that position just after I got elected because I got the diagnosis the week after I got elected. And people said, don't resign that position. Uh, you don't have a support system. Because, and this is what they said to me, all you know how to do is work. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to be sick and you're going to have to heal. So you better stay on the board of directors and do your public service and pay back mm -hmm. to psychology. And that was the best advice that I could have gotten at that time. So I worked and I developed in public service and I also learned about social networking. In, in our family and in my child raising, I didn't know anything about social networking or what you did or what was required. I didn't know, even know how to dress. You know, I just knew that you go to work, you do a good job no matter what work you're doing. I wrapped packages at Robinson's Beverly Hills for eight years while I was working and going to school. And um, I just knew how to go to work and I knew that because I was single, if anybody else needed anything, like, if your child was sick or, you know, your husband needed you to go pick them up, I was the one that was going to take over and do the job. And so that's a very, very different. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems like we all sort of got to the same place, not exactly knowing what our role is, but exactly knowing how to be successful, you know, by keeping our options open. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, can sure, I just please. comment? On the clothes piece, because it brought back a memory that I was recently talking to colleagues about. You know, as, a, as an immigrant from another country to the US, when you join the world of work, um, now I realize how you dress at work, uh -huh. how important that is for your status at work, for your opportunities at work. And when I first came to this country, I had no idea that in a department store like Macy's, there's a difference between the Mrs. section and the women's section. And I would shop at the women's section. I was a woman, I shopped at the women's section. The well, women's section was for older women. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the clothes I would buy, I had never worn dresses. I used to wear pants in India, but never dresses. And I sort of felt compelled to look like everybody else at work, even though I had hair up to my hips that I wore in a long bun. I had a nose stud, which now is popular, but wasn't then. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and wore these frumpy clothes with bows and, you know, lots of layers. And I thought I was in a dress. So I'm, and it was amazing how kind my colleagues were. Because when I look at those photographs, <laughs> I cannot believe that I went to work like that. And, and nobody said anything. And I recall um, a senior woman who was a fellow in the office um, Staging, I'm sure she staged it. This didn't just happen. Her hanging around, she was a very wealthy woman, but she was just, and dressed impeccably. Hanging around in the copy room, you know, in the Xerox room while I was Xeroxing something, looking through a catalog, the women will understand this, of Chadwick's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she never bought clothes in Chadwick's. <laughs> looking through that catalog and saying to me, Gita, look at that. Wouldn't that look good on you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And I, for the first time, discovered catalog shopping. I didn't know that existed. And looked at it with her and said, you're right. And that's how she taught me how to dress. Or the day before a big conference when I was supposed to be on stage, when my boss, as I was leaving the office, said, you'll be in a suit tomorrow, right? And I panicked. I went home and said to my husband, we have to buy a suit. I went to the mall, into the store called Casual Corner, mm -hmm. where there was an African-American woman who could tell I had no blood in my face and said to me, <laughs> can I help you? And I said, I need a suit. I've never worn one. I don't know how to buy one. I don't know what it should look like on me. She said, you just wait here, honey. I'm going to help you. Yeah. And she kitted me out in the suit with the shell and everything on. And then I said, but what about my feet? And what do I wear on my legs? And she said, pantyhose and shoes. I said, which kind? She said, just wait right here at 7.30 in the evening. Huh. She went running down the mall, bought me my shoes, bought me my pantyhose, kitted me out. I wore the same outfit two days in a row at the conference. <laughs> <laughs> I just raised this because there are hurdles as women yeah. that we face in career building mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. people don't talk about. And it's just very tough when you come from another country and it stands in the way. It does. You don't get taken seriously if you don't look right. It may be different now. It certainly wasn't then. You know, my boss, I was doing a work study job, and my boss said to me, where did you get that? I said, um, at the church down the road. <laughs> and she said, have you ever been in a department store? This was when I was still a student, but I was doing work study, right? And I said, no. She said, well, so-and-so will take you. And I, I didn't have the heart to say, well, I don't have the money to, to go and buy anything. So so-and-so so, so took me, and we went and looked. And she showed me the kinds of things that maybe I would look nicer in work. So I went to the next rummage sale. You know, that's what they call garage sales now. Right. But they were rummage sales in the olden days. And I went to the next church rummage sale and found more appropriate clothes. But, you know, you really don't know if you're not exposed to that. And my, my parents, you know, they were immigrants, so they didn't know. So yeah. mm -hmm. it is a big deal. Yeah. And, and can you all talk about some of the other challenges you face with women of Asian descent or Im women who are immigrants? Well, one of the things that happens is that you're not worth very much. Like, we were, ra we were the only Asian family. Well, there was one Japanese Asian family that was farmers in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I was raised. And my father finally got an immigrant professor's job at New Mexico State University. That means they got paid one quarter the salary of the uh, US citizen. Uh, professors, even though my father got his degree from Cal Berkeley. So um, what, one of the things that happens is um, you get called names like Yellow mm -hmm. all the time. And you know, that was the time of the internment camps, just after the internment camps. And so um, one of the hurdles, it's a big hurdle, was learning how to speak without an accent. Mm -hmm. um, we would sit on the bed every night and listen to the radio and listen to somebody in this city someplace called San Francisco. And we would listen to that person talk and then we would get books and we would open them and we would read them. So most people know that I don't have very much of an accent and it's because in my childhood we were taught not to have an accent of any kind. We couldn't have a Mexican accent because my father was a bit biased against Mexicans uh, so he didn't want us to have a Mexican accent. Uh, they definitely didn't want us to have a Chinese squeaky voice accent because then we would be recognized. And then we would have to, you know, maybe go to internment camp even though we were Chinese. Mm -hmm. And um, so the only option we had was to learn to speak like the admired people on the radio. Mm -hmm. So we learned to speak that way. So. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of an incident when somebody in, um, in a department store, when I was shopping with my husband, said to me, uh, what's that accent? And he turned around and said, she has an Indian accent, you have an American accent, both are, Amer both are accents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but people don't think that way. They think mm -hmm. you have the accent and we speak right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it took a lot to get used to the American accent. Mm -hmm. I remember going to McDonald's and being asked, given 20 choices, do you want, I said, I wanted egg and toast. And there were 16 different ways in which egg was served and 20 different ways of <laughs> different types of bread and sandwiches and not sandwiches. And, and I started crying because one, I couldn't understand what she was saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And second, it was, it was just overwhelming. And then when I said to her, I don't understand, can you slow down? She said, what do you say? What do you say? She just couldn't understand me. And she said, why don't you speak in English? And I said, but I am. <laughs> and I finally left because I just couldn't get myself understood. Mm -hmm. And there's also the usage. You know, words, mm -hmm. sure, right. words are different. Um, taking my daughter to a Halloween parade when I was new to the country, my first thing out, my foray out into the community, I dressed her up in the costume and everything and called the office of the apartment complex to say, um, is the, um, where is the parade? Mm -hmm. And she said, didn't you, I said something about the circular. I said, I read the circular because notices, what in this country you call notices, in India we used to call circulars. And I said, I read the circular. And she said, it's not in the circle, ma'am, it's in the square. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'm trying to ask you. And we went back and forth like that, <laughs> totally misunderstanding each other. Mm -hmm. I never took my daughter to the Halloween parade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are those hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's sexism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's plenty of that. And, and it's, it's subtle. I experienced it in subtle forms. So in meetings, um, the first meeting I came home and said, some senior economist from the World Bank said what I said was interesting. Isn't that great? Yes. And my husband said, no, honey interesting is used very differently in this country. That's right. That's interesting as a way to shut you up often. Mm -hmm. um, and then I began to notice that you say something, they say that's interesting, and then nothing else is said. And they say and it. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. And, and, it, and it becomes a Somebody else a says fact. it, and all of a sudden everybody's discussing mm -hmm. that point, and you feel invisible. Yeah, that's right. You feel you're sitting there feeling totally invisible. So I had to teach myself to interrupt at that point and mm -hmm. say, that's what I just said. Mm -hmm. and you're right, and then take the discussion forward. But it takes courage to do that. Mm -hmm. well, it's and, not easy. And I got told, I, I said to somebody, I was on the board of directors, and I said to somebody, didn't I just say what Dr. So-and-so said? Yeah. And he, he whispered to me, he says, yeah. He says, it's the girly thing. Yeah. It's a very prominent psychologist, so I'm not going to use names. <laughs> so this, this was in 1995. So we're not talking really ancient history. But yeah, th he's doing the girly thing. It's OK. Mm. It made me very and I angry. would have been in UCLA doing my PhD in psychology if it weren't for sexism in India. Because I didn't Duh. have the money to pay for the tuition or mm -hmm. the travel. My parents had enough money for a one-way ticket. And I was too scared to do that mm -hmm. and land here with no money to pay my tuition. So I applied to a Rotary scholarship. And they, they, I got into the final round, and I was the one of two. They had to make a choice between two. And the other was a gentleman who was studying civil engineering mm -hmm. abroad. And we went for the interview. We were both in the waiting room. He was called in first, and then I was called in. And there were a panel of four men, all businessmen. And the questions were, do you plan to get married? Mm -hmm. And I was stunned, and I said yes. What are you going abroad to do again? I said, clinical psychology. And they said, so, and then you'll come back and get married? And why would that be a good investment for us? Mm -hmm. And then they just bluntly told me, the other candidate will probably get it because he is going to come back and build bridges. And you're just going to come back and raise a family. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually denied mm -hmm. that scholarship and de developed such an anger about it mm -hmm. that I swore I would do my entire education in India, never go for it, <laughs> took it all out in the wrong way. Um, and then over the course of many years realized that that kind of sexism holds so many women back. Mm -hmm. You know, this wasn't as um, isolated, isolated incident. Yeah. Right. And it happens in the United States all the time. Yeah. Some of the research I do looks at confronting racism and sexism. And so I do these experiments in which I get people to imagine themselves being in a context in which someone says something really racist. Um, 
And everybody, when they're imagining it, thinks, oh, I'm going to stand up, I'm going to confront the person. Mm -hmm. But when you actually put them in that context, yeah. almost no one does, right? right? And people expect women, when they see sexism, to step up. But when they do, they're evaluated very negatively. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it has an impact. I mean, it's important to do. I'm not saying don't do it. But there's a huge backlash against women who actually confront. Um, and so one of the really nice things about my lab is I have a lab in which I have you know, really diverse students. I have Muslims and blacks and Asians. And um, it's almost a safe space where we can sit and complain to each other <laughs> about you know, even minor abuses, right? Not being mm -hmm. taken seriously, not being heard. Um, to fairly extreme cases where they're not getting jobs. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's somewhere where I feel that's probably one of the most, one of the things I'm most proud of, mm -hmm. that they can come here and feel like they're comfortable enough that they won't be evaluated negatively, that they can talk about the really, um, some of the really negative uh, impacts of being a minority. So, yeah. So our time has gone really fast. I have, I have one more question I'd like to ask and then to invite you all to ask questions um, of our panelists. So, um, so that question is, what do you think of, is in psychology's future? Like how do you see, um, what do you see the important challenges being over the next 10 to 15 years for the field or for psychologists? I'm, I'm out, out, of, out of the pure psychology sort of field, so. Um, it's difficult to say, but I'll tell you the behavioral sciences and psychology in particular was invaluable to developing prevention strategies for HIV. Mm -hmm. And as I discovered, developing prevention and treatment work for Ebola mm -hmm. when I was in UNICEF. So understanding the, the psychology and the sociology of communities and getting community engagement in a sense mm -hmm. of ownership over solutions mm -hmm. that require behavior change is so important right. that the folks who think they're doing medicine don't often recognize, mm -hmm. right? right? So getting the public health field that is packed with doctors <laughs> to understand that there's a behavioral element to this and there's a social normative element to this that right. needs a deeper understanding of what holds behaviors in place and it's not just admonishing individuals, wear a condom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First, I'm a woman, I don't wear a condom. <laughs> Second, I don't have any leverage over my man mm -hmm. to tell him to use a condom. Mm -hmm. So it's those, those insights that seem so clear to me, so apparent, given the training I had, right. that were totally absent in the conversations that I'd hear. And I was struck because I used to always feel a bit of a fraud being in public health. Mm -hmm. I don't have a public health degree why I'm in public health. And then I recognized I have something so valuable to offer public health. And it's the psychology training. So how can psychology then as a field mm -hmm. begin to recognize its applications in all of these different other fields mm -hmm. um, is what I would say, you know, moving forward. And that for students to be able to recognize that you can make a contribution by um, stepping into those other fields and taking your skill sets there. Yeah, you know, yeah. psychology is the number one major at most universities now. And it's because psychology and the study of human behavior can be so versatile in so many different areas. Business, science per se, yeah. management. Mm -hmm. um, my area was uh, medical psychology and I started a lot of that in the Midwest uh, where I forced the interns to develop liaisons with the medical people, even though the medical mm -hmm. people didn't want us, to the point when I was at an international conference on uh, gastric bypass surgery that everybody worldwide was calling me and asking me what I had told the surgeon that I was working with. Because the surgeon announced in the conference, and I was there, <clears throat> developing, uh, talking about psychological aspects of medical chronic illness and medical addiction and so on and so forth. And uh, he only made one statement about me. He said, I'm glad the day I met Dr. Chang at the medical center because the day we developed working together, my telephone stopped ringing. That's really big for psychology because psychologists know how to communicate with human beings. Uh, 
that's not necessarily something that's stressed in other fields. So psychology basically, uh, because of the communications and the understanding of the behavior and that they can communicate that sort of uh, understanding to other people, because of that, it's going to be the foremost, most needed mm -hmm. area. It's just that the students that are up and coming have to be innovative, they have to be flexible, and they have to keep their eyes open, awareness. And if they do that, there's always going to be room for them in uh, major job opportunities and also in major personal relationships. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think psychology is going to change in two different ways from, from what it is now. I think um, the way we do research is changing. Um, the way we conduct, re conduct research, what we think are good research practices are really going through a kind of a huge evolution right now and the way that we write it up and publish it. Um, and so that, that's going to be, I think, a really big change in the future and psychology is driving um, those kind of research practices mm -hmm. beyond even psychology into medical science and a lot of different areas. Um, and second, um, I think that there are going to be a lot more women in the field. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There are many more women now in uh, undergraduate programs and going into graduate school and even in early careers, associate assistant professors, associate professors. Mm -hmm. So um, I think women are just going to take much more of a leadership role and have much more impact on the field in the future, um, which I see as a very positive thing. And just, mm -hmm. One of the things we worry about in that happening is what uh, Dorothy Cantor used to talk about is the feminization. Mm -hmm of psychology. So one of the messages that we have to give women is not to let that happen. Because the feminization of psychology means that uh, the importance goes decreases. And we want the importance to increase. And also, we do not want the salary levels and the appreciation of management and so on and so forth to decrease as stereotypically things decrease when women enter the yep. workforce. Yep. And all of us can attest to that, yep. no matter what area that we work in. So that's something that we really have to be aware of. So well, I'm pleased to bring to your attention that um, last year we produced a report called The Changing Gender Composition mm -hmm. of Psychology. Um, that's tracking those um, numbers. numbers and with some recommendations on how to um, buttress that effect. Good. Yeah. And then just to follow up, Dr. Kawakami, can you talk a little bit about how you see research changing or public publishing changing? Um, I think uh, about the last 10 years or so, they're realizing that a lot of, um, a lot of research, both in medical science and psychology and a lot of other fields, um, is not being replicated, is not replicable, mm -hmm. right? So they're having a hard time replicating the findings that are in some of our journals. And so they're changing um, the way that we do science, you know, the part, how many participants we have, who the participants are, um, the, the quality of the statistics. And there are a lot of really major changes going on in, in research right now. Um, and the way that we're just more transparent in reporting our research. Right? And we're reporting studies that do work and that don't work so that we know what the full uh, outcome is of the research that's being carried out. And um, yeah, just a lot of really important, um, interesting um, pathways forward that we're still trying to figure out right now. Mm -hmm. I think we're right, I don't even know if we're in the middle, we're right at the beginning, I think, of this whole new um, evolution in research. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang, Dr. Rao Gupta, Dr. Kawakami. Um, I know that you all probably have additional questions. Um, as we close the panel um, and thank our guests, I just want to let you know that we'll take our panelists outside and you can greet them in the multi-purpose area um, after we close down the presentation. So join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.